Okay, so we'll talk about encryption. We're kind of, since we're talking about websites, we'll focus on password encryption, but it's really encryption for any, um, any, any, any string you want uh, encrypted. And what we'll do is we'll talk about what's sometimes referred to as a one-way encryption, where you, t you take a string and you change its letters around so if somebody saw it with their eyes, they wouldn't know what it was but you wouldn't be able to reverse back to where it came from. And then there's two-way encryption where you can encrypt it to, a no, uh, to another string and then turn it back. Um, then we'll talk about rainbows or what's sometimes called a spectrum. That, well, uh, it's probably better to go uh, to look at an example of that. So let's say, for example, we were creating a website <coughs> and in our database, we had a table for user IDs and passwords and first names and last names and addresses and phone numbers and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and anybody who works at the company, let's say we were at Facebook or LinkedIn or YouTube, anybody who works at the company who has access to this database can start seeing everybody's passwords. So I'm using, I'm using the Seinfeld names. And is, that, is that show uh, shown in England? Seinfeld? Is that oh, yes. Name? Okay. All right. So. Uh, Jerry, I think, is a big Superman fan. I think he uses Superman's father's name as his password. There was an episode where they were talking about that password. And George Costanza used Bosco, the chocolate drink. That's his favorite drink. So, so in that show, uh, that was his password. So anyway, um, if somebody who worked at the company got a hold of this data, well, a lot of people use the same password for their banking and, you know, People don't make a different password for every website that they log into. So this would actually be very valuable information for a malicious person to have. So it would be good if we could record the passwords in a way so that if somebody ever who works at the company or broke into the system and got a copy of this table, this information would be useless to them. However, when uh, somebody goes to log in, it would actually have value. So for example, if if Costanza at Seinfeld.com logged in with the password Bosco, we type in Bosco, we would encrypt what he typed in and compare it against what we encrypted when he originally created the account to see if they match. So what we would do is, um, so what we want to do for string encryption um, would be like, the, yeah, I kind of just described what this is saying. If there was an employee there who got these pairs, the user ID and password pairs uh, for millions of people, this could end up being a problem. So what we'd like to do is we would like to somehow encrypt them. So I'm going to follow, just to talk about what encryption is, uh, I'm just going to give a really simple example of an encryption algorithm. So what I'm going to say is, for every letter in the word, we're going to change the letter to the next letter. So if the letter is B, we're going to encrypt it by changing it to a C. And then since Z, there's no letter after Z, we'll make Z's become A's. <clears throat> so for example, if your password was ABC, we don't want to record ABC in the database. We'll encrypt it to A becomes B, B becomes C, and C becomes D. So this will end up being the encrypted password. Another example would be the unencrypted password is Bosco. So the encrypted version, B becomes C, O becomes P, S becomes T, C becomes D, and O becomes P. So we would store this in the uh, database instead. So the idea is that our database would look something like this. <coughs> now assuming this, this is not a very rigorous uh, encryption algorithm, but at least it's something. It just kind of gets the point across. If somebody who works with a company got a copy of this, it would hopefully be useless to them because they couldn't log in as Jerry at Seinfeld.com. Couldn't log into that bank and type this in because that bank won't take it. Because it, it's hopefully it's in the looks like nonsense to that bank. But if Jerry was to log into our website, he would type in this as his user ID. He would type in, uh, this is uh, Superman encrypted. <clears throat> he would type in Superman. We would take that, run it through our encryption algorithm, which would give us this. And then we would compare what he just typed in encrypted to this to see if they match. And if it matches, we let him in. So it could be used 
as a password to let them in, but if somebody ever got a hold of this information, it would be useless. How does it work if Jerry forgets his password and he sends the administrator a request for the password and all the administrator would have is the encrypted? Well, so, okay, that's, a, this, that's actually a good question. So the website picks an encryption algorithm, mm -hmm. so, right? So not, not the user picks it. So if, for example, a user says, I forgot my password, they, uh, so what you're saying, could we take this and tell them it's Superman? Yeah, they, that won't, especially, if, I'll get into examples later, where if it's a one-way encryption, we can't even come back to it. If it was, now this is a two-way encryption. We, this encryption algorithm can have a reverse to it. We can actually, it's, this encryption algorithm is reversible. If we wanted to, we could unencrypt it and tell them what it was. Okay. But the better thing to do would be just give them a brand new password, okay. encrypt that one, and then send them an email saying your new password is this. Go change it. You know, that's what most websites would do. <clears throat> but that's a good, that's a good question. Um, if if the encryption algorithm is reversible, we could unencrypt and just tell them what his password used to be. But then it'd probably get nervous that if <laughs> someone you know people who work at the company could do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um, suppose, okay, so now the question is uh, how safe are these encryption algorithms? And especially if you join these like little knick-knack websites and they want you to do a password and user ID, you want to know like this pass, you know, this isn't a big uh, website, uh, is my password safe? And the answer is hopefully it's safe. Um, but suppose you didn't know what the encryption algorithm does, but you have access to it. So, for example, the PHP programming language has a string encryption algorithm that comes with it. It's called crypt. And you can put a word in it, it'll encrypt it and spit out a result. So anybody can download that algorithm for free. Even if they don't know what it's doing, they have access to it. So what could they do <coughs> if they had access to it? Well, one thing they could do is they could take every possible input you could give and compute what, even though they don't know what the encryption algorithm does, they could take every possible input you could give it, run it through the algorithm and record the result, and build this enormous table. So they could say, like, now let's say for example, um, we're only going to use letters, no numbers. We'll make the example a little bit easier. <clears throat> so for example, our encryption algorithm we're using here, an A would become a B, a B would become a C, blah, 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 and then eventually you get Z would become an A, then we would do, try all the combinations with two letters. A, A would become B, B, blah, blah, and then Z, Z would become A, A, and you know, we'd keep building them until we have, let's say we went up to eight letters. So if this kept going and going and going, we'd eventually get to the point where we do B, O, S, C, N. B-O-S-C-O, B-O-S-C-P, like we would just be trying every combination and seeing what the results are. <clears throat> so eventually we would have Bosco. If Bosco was your input, this is the encrypted version of it. And then further on, if Superman was your input, this is what it looks like encrypted. <clears throat> so if you built this table, if you, so here's the thing, if you had access to the encryption algorithm, even though you didn't know what it does, if you had access to it, and you wanted to build this table, you could build this big chart of this uh, encrypted password came from this, this came from this. As long as you have access to the uh, algorithm, you can build this. Now, as you can imagine, um, the more letters the password has, the more time consuming it is. So, how safe are your algorithm? Uh, somebody can build this table, and sometimes this table is called uh, the the encryption algorithm's rainbow. So some people call it the rainbow, and some people call it the spectrum. But it's like all the components of what came into the algorithm. So I don't know if rainbow's a good word. Rainbow is kind of like all the all the colors that come from light. From light. From light. So like a breakdown of where everything came from. I don't know if that's a good word for it. But anyway, 
<coughs> if we had a website that required all passwords must be of length one, it would take 26 computations to, to you know, just run the encryption algorithm 26 times, once with A as input, once with B, and we're done. <coughs> if we allow up to two letters, then it would be 26 times 26 different combinations. So that's 676, and then up to three letters, it would be 26 times 26 times 26 different combinations. <coughs> so if we allow up to eight letters for a password, uh, we end up with, these are all the combinations with exactly eight letters, this is all the combinations with seven letters, and so on, and this all added up comes to this number. So it ended up being about 217 trillion different combinations with eight unique letters. No, not even unique, up to eight letters. This is with no numbers. Now, obviously, if we added more numbers, we have 26 letters plus 10 digits, zero through nine, then it would be like 36 times 36, that would be dramatically larger. But even if we just try to keep it a little simple and say eight letters, we can have, uh, it would take 27 trillion computations to compute the rainbow of our uh, algorithm. So the code for our algorithm, if somebody wanted to sit down at their desk and write a program that prints out the entire rainbow of an encryption algorithm, it would look something like this. For every word uh, between A and Z, 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 so that would be every combination from one to eight letters, which is, we said, 217 trillion combinations. We say the encrypted word, we call the encryption algorithm, pass the word in, and then write the results out to some table. So we could compute the rainbow of an encryption algorithm. <coughs> so just to give a little time and space, how much, if somebody wanted to do this, like let's say there was a, a famous website like Facebook, and there's tons and tons of passwords encrypted in a database, if somebody got a whole, if somebody who worked at Facebook knew the encryption algorithm and got a copy of it, they might want to put the effort into building the rainbow for the password. So if we had 27 trillion um, different pairs to calculate, um, let me see. Oh, okay, um, so then 10 billion, so I, I wanted to calculate this in, uh, in time, how much time it would take. If we had, uh, if we were able to write to main memory, not out to a disk drive, it would take about approximately six hours. This is assuming that the amount of time it takes to run the encryption algorithm is one instruction on a computer, and that's not realistic, because they're gonna take you know, letters and multiplying by numbers, they're going to perform a pretty, pretty rigorous computation. But if, there were, if the amount of work done to encrypt a password was one instruction on a computer, it would still take about six hours to compute the rainbow for um, up to eight characters in a password. But a more realistic thing would be several months to compute it, if you take in the amount of time it actually takes to encrypt the password. So for every uh, word followed by a, so, so this would be a, pro, you know, I just want to give an approximation of how much time it would take, then also how much space, how much computer memory you have to buy to run a computer that will compute the rainbow of, a, of an encryption algorithm. So we have to record uh, the input word and the encrypted word, which is a pair of 16 characters, you know, let's say it's eight characters and the encrypted value was eight and there are 217 trillion of them, so it would come out to about three and a half terabits of storage we would need to store this. So, have you, have you, has it, I haven't gone to Staples in a while, but a computer now has about one, is it popular to have one terabit? I just bought one that has one, one terabyte. Of hard drive? Yeah. Okay, so you could buy more, I guess you could buy those, you know, those plug-in terabit things? Yeah. And those come, like, one, they're one or one and a half terabits now? the external drives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you could, if you wanted to, like you can picture a, you know, someone who works for Google or something wanting to do this at lunchtime. But they would have to, it's not just as simple as buy a laptop and, and write the program. You kind of 
have to buy like lots of disk drives and plug them in and let this thing run for weeks or months. And if we allowed digits, it could go into many months or even, even over a year just to compute the rainbow. Yeah. But the important thing to understand is it can be computed. <laughs> and there was a, uh, I think there was a website, I think it was out of the UK, that where somebody, um, one of the, there's like three popular algorithms in PHP for encryption and somebody computed, you know, built a, like a supercomputer and spent months doing it and com computed the whole rainbow. So you could go to their website and type in an encrypted password and it'll tell you what the original was. So it's doable and it's probably worth doing if you can get like a dump of, let's say, Facebook or, you know, YouTube, some big website that has tons and tons of passwords. Um, and, and so it is doable. So now what we'd like to do is make it difficult on the people who do this. So you would use that table to do a, re a reverse lookup? So right. Someone's real password is... Right. And then, yeah, let me just, while we're on this topic, um, let me go back one. Um, right, so pretty much any encryption algorithm that is available to the public, it is possible to compute its rainbow which would be every combination of before encryption and after encryption pair. Now it may take months and a very, very expensive computer to do it, but it's doable. <coughs> so unless you want to have every website in the world has to go write its own complicated encryption algorithm, you'd like to use someone else's so it'll just take you two seconds, use their algorithm and hope nobody computes the rainbow and starts stealing your customers' uh, passwords. So, um, yeah, like I say, it, it, it's, it's definitely computable, and if somebody ever did one and posted on a website, it would probably be a popular website to go to. How is it, how are, is the person doing this alerted that the, the encryption has been, or the de-encryption has been successful? I mean, how do you know when it's, what the correct combination is? You get this rainbow of all the possibilities, right? And how do you know which one is the winner, winner, chicken dinner? I mean, um, so let's let's say you which can, one's the Bosco? Well, no. So what it is is you would take you would get, so this is uh, supposed to be the rainbow, Not that I'm like use. every combination. Right. This is here would be the input, and here's the encrypted version. If you so if you computed this rainbow, and you also had. Um, this information. Oh, okay. You, what you could do is you can take this, take this. So if you got a dump of this saying this user ID and this password are together, then you could go to your rainbow and you could go do a lookup. Even this lookup would be very time consuming. Because <laughs> right, yeah. you're going to go, does it match this? Does oh, it match God, this? Yes. So you're okay. gonna, and you've gone, oh, I found a match. This is the guy's password. It would, t it would be time consuming. Yes. Okay. Because <laughs> encrypted words aren't even going to be in alphabetical order. No, so no there is, it would be all sorted. random, so it's like a linear search. Yeah. So even, even doing a lookup will take a while. And I'll show you a website, and, and it says, like, if, it, if the password has seven characters, use this one. If it has eight, use this, because the one that's eight is going to take exponentially longer than seven. <laughs> so the point is, if you know the encrypted right. password, you can work backwards and find what your right. password is. If you compute the entire table, right. which could take months and an extremely expensive gotcha. computer. Gotcha. But, um, oh yeah, one, one other thing I wanted to say was um, when I was talking about the amount of time, um, the amount of time and, and the amount and how expensive the computer is to compute this, what you could do is you could compute up to, let's say, five or six letters. Um, The amount of time it would take, like if you wanted to compute for inputs that go up to maybe six letters. Mm -hmm. So this would be, I kind of calculated this to be a, possibly a, like a month or two to calculate if you go up to eight letters. Seven letters was a matter of hours, like about six or seven hours. Up to six letters could be done in less than a day, like it might take about six hours. Like, mm -hmm. You know, somebody who works at Google might do this at lunchtime, write a program that just prints out everything, and by the end of the day, they'll have the whole rainbow for up to six letters. 
So that's why a lot of websites, and if you think about it, if you let your customers pick how many letters they want, most people are lazy. They'll pick like, you know, their dog's name or something like four or five letters and stop. So if you let if your website lets people use up to let's say just six letters, you can some a hacker can easily compute the rainbow of it in a few hours and look up your web your uh, your password. <clears throat> so that's why a lot of websites like require a minimum of eight letters because if you don't require that, people get lazy and a hacker can find your password in a few hours. So a hacker already knows in advance and what the chances are of him finding. Uh, of constructing that whole table because he, if he knows what your password restrictions are, uh, he, he can say, well, they're limited to six characters, this is worth doing. Yeah, whereas whereas said, right, right, right. Yeah. And if, if it requires eight, um, this is all the combinations with eight, this is the combinations with seven, they can skip these, but there's not a whole lot of savings. It's when you get into the eight and the nine, that if, that's when it starts taking weeks and months to calculate. So that's why websites usually require up to eight. Well, have you seen one that requires like six or more? Or no, they've, a lot of them have switched because I remember I used to have six and right. a lot of them have required you to go to eight now. Yeah, I remember a few years, uh, not, well, maybe like five years ago, yeah. there was six would be fine. Now it, you can calculate the rainbow of six pretty quickly. Yeah. Also now if you consider that you have upper and lower case characters and special characters as well. And a lot of them require a special character in right. there and a capital or whatever, upper or lower case. Right, they require one number and yeah. one capital. Yeah, so that right. really makes computing. like an ampersand or something. Right, then it, then it it almost turns into years to compute the yeah. uh, the rainbow of it. So so, but now the thing is this. So suppose some some algorithm, let's say a PHP programming language, gives an algorithm called encrypt, and uh, you put a word in and it spits out an answer, and you require your users to have at least eight letters. So that would make the people who are hacking your system, computing the rainbow, it would make them spend a lot of time and money, but they can still do it. But once they compute the rainbow, you're in trouble. So then they came up with the idea of you, you, you have an encryption algorithm. There's a word you're trying to encrypt that's, that's coming from your user. And then there's another um, input that comes from you which makes your encryption algorithm somewhat unique. Making it very hard, it's still possible to compute the rainbow, but it makes it very hard. Now every company like LinkedIn and Facebook, they all have a different rainbow. So for example, I don't know if you can figure out what, what these numbers mean and why this came out encrypted this way, but like Bosco became this CPTDP when we used the raise everything by one letter. <coughs> So now I'm saying if we were to encrypt Bosco and use, and they, the popular phrase for this is salt, and sometimes they call it seasoning, but you're like adding something to, the, to what's going in the oven. <laughs> so they call this the salt of the encryption algorithm, but it's just another input that gets used in doing the encryption. So again, I'm, I'm using a simple example to, to get the, across the idea of salt. We take Bosco and then we increment every letter by whatever is in our salt. So the encryption, the encryption algorithm with the salt of 11111 is actually what we were using just before. But if we wanted to encrypt Bosco using a different salt, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, well then we we're taking our algorithm saying take the B and have it increment by one letter. Take the O and have it increment by two letters. So it's O, P, Q instead of P. So the salt will actually cause the encryption to change, right? Depending on what, so this would be like, let's say this is the customer. Let's say this is a customer who has, is a member of Facebook and Google and LinkedIn. But those three companies use three different salts. Their password, which is the same, is going to look different in all three databases. And if somebody wanted to compute the rainbow for Facebook, they would have to use Facebook salt, then take a few months to compute it. And then if they wanted to do the rainbow for LinkedIn, they'd have to take LinkedIn salt. So, and they would have to know a couple of things. They'd have to know the algorithm, which is usually generally available. But they'd have to know the company salt. And it might take a few months to compute it. And if the company changed its salt every once, once every few months, then they'd never be able to keep up with it. 
So well, this if is they the change I, their sort, though. That means they have to run all those passwords through the database again. Well, so so yeah, this is kind of a, a side conversation. So let's say you were running a company, and you used an encryption algorithm that uses salt. And then you, as a, the person running your company, you make up a random salt and use that. Suppose you want to, because a rainbow can be computed in a few months, you want to change the salt every few months. But you have people who have the password encrypted with last month's salt. And if you go to a new salt, like how can you get, how can you get them to migrate up to the new salt? You don't know their password, so you can't take their unencrypted password and run it through the new salt so and record it. Encrypted. What's that? You double encrypt it then. So you have to de-encrypt it twice? Well, you're, you're kind of hoping that this encryption algorithm is not provided by you. It's provided by like some you know, famous encryption people. Mm -hmm. So you can't unencrypt it, right. otherwise it's no good. Of course. But, um, but what I, so one thing you could do is if somebody goes to, let's say you change your soul. If somebody logs in, you would encrypt the word they're typing in today with this month's soul which is going to now not match. So then you think, oh, maybe they, the last time this person logged in was a month ago, so you use last month's salt. And if that matches, then you reload, you reload them with the new salt. So, because they just now typed in their unsalted. You take, right. But now, unfortunately, if you change your salt every month and someone hasn't logged in in a year, you're trying last month's salt, that's no good. Two months ago salt, that's no good until you find the right one and then upgrade them. So no. some websites have a rule that you have to change your password every so often. Because yes, maybe they're changing the salt. And also, you know, for your own protection, like if you slipped out and let someone know your password, it forces you to change one. But that's one way to not have like if the if the website wants to change a salt every month and someone has it logged in in a year and a half. They don't take a long time finding the, which salt it is, but they could just keep a log of all the salts they've used since mm -hmm. they've started and just try them all to see if your password matches. What would the user experience <coughs> on their end? Would they just get a failed password, or would they would it, would they get an admin message saying that something has happened with their password? I mean, if this well, happens with the salt changing, if they time, let's say the website changes the salt yeah. every month. Well, no. Let's say, and, and let's say you're logging into your account, but you haven't logged in in the last two years. Right. The your website keeps a, I guess, a list of the last 24 months worth of salts, and it keeps trying whatever you just typed in today. It encrypts it using the last 24 so months, looking for a match. And let's say it can go back as far as let's say they decide to go back two. So years. it's seamless for the user. Right. right. It might maybe okay. maybe it's it'll just take a little bit longer to okay. log in because it's all the searching being done and encrypting until they finally find a match. Gotcha. Then when they find your match, they take what the password you just typed in and encrypt it with this month's all, and now you're like updating. Updated. Gotcha. Yeah. So yeah, it's doable that way. And then also to avoid that, they could just require you to change your password every month. <laughs> but. They don't really need to do that. Um, okay, so the the couple of, uh, there's a couple of popular um, encryption algorithms. One is called the MD, and then it's always followed by a number. And this came out around uh, 1991, which is right around well, the internet. When did that become generally? It was 92. Available to the I think public. I got my first email account in '93. Okay. And I was the first person in my office to have one. Okay, so that's when they kind of needed this. So this is, there was a, a, I think it was a professor at MIT. He's one of the, there's like four professors who wrote this famous algorithms book. But um, so the MD1, MD2, MD3 series, MD stands for Message Digest. <laughs> uh, that came out in the '90s. And then the secure hash algorithm, the SHA followed by a number, SHA123, that was created by uh, United States NSA. Mm -hmm. So that's a popular algorithm. It's on Unix systems. It's in uh, you know, the different programming languages like Perl and Python and Ruby. And now um, they use one called crypt where you would give a password and the salt. So this would be typed in from your customer and this would be based on your website. <coughs> So, um, yeah, put this link in. Let me click on this link. So this is a website of, I guess, malicious people. Um, um, 
So, yeah, so this is a website called um, Rainbow Crack Pro Rainbow Crack Project. <laughs> so uh, what they do is you, know, you can pick the algorithms. This is, uh, okay, so for example, I don't know if this is going to be readable on the camera, but it says, uh, this is the MD5 algorithm where you have one to seven characters. Okay. And then you can click on these links and you can type in a password of, uh, the encrypted version of a password and it'll tell you what the original was. Yeah. So they computed the the uh, rainbow for up to seven characters, then they have one to eight characters, one to nine characters, and then up to one to ten. This goes into like months and months now to calculate these. Um, and this is actually, yeah, so this would be uh, lowercase alphas with a number, lowercase alphas with a number, mixed with a number, but it only goes as high as nine. So it, it's, it's, it's very involved to calculate it, and the reason, what you would think, why don't they just leave the one with the most options, but even doing the lookup takes a lot of time. Remember we were saying, like, you're searching the whole table, so it could take hours to look it up, and if you know it, there's only one to seven characters, you might want to use the quicker rainbow. Mm -hmm. But this is, uh, I guess, apparently it's legal <laughs> to produce these tables. And, uh, Okay, so um, so yeah, so the, the these were pretty popular ones. I think the MD series, the message digest, is starting to fade away because they're, they're pretty easy to um, you know crack them. But the uh, SHA, the I think they're both SHA, shy. Um, that's a pretty popular one. And then the Crypt, which is comes with PHP, uses a combination of MD and the SHA in their encryption algorithm. And it's one that you have to use a salt with, uh, which is a good thing to do. So this was, do you remember this story in the oh, yeah. news? So LinkedIn, very famous website, lots of members, right? That's the like kind of job search website, it's I guess. It's like Facebook for grown-ups. Yeah, well, Facebook for working people, yes. I guess. Okay. <laughs> well, people who want to work or change jobs or something like that. But there was an article in the newspaper that they were using the SHA algorithm, the SHA-1, where you have the option to make up a company salt and put the salt in, and they didn't put the salt in. So uh, I think there was, a, there was an article on it. Yeah, so the, the article is on some tech, uh, tech website, but it says here that the passwords were stored using unsalted um, SHA-1 hashes, which is just you know fancy word for uh, encryption for an algorithm. <coughs> and um, about, I don't know, 6% of their entire database somehow became public. They never found out if it was an inside job or an outside job. Someone got in, but basically got the user ID and password combination the, the user ID and the encrypted password combination. And then people could go to one of those websites that produce the rainbow and look up the passwords for uh, the members. <laughs> so yeah, that was big. That was a couple years ago that was in the news. Um, OK, and then yeah, I wanted to, so now we're, we're starting to, this is like this concept of soul thing. Is a, that's an important concept when we start talking, and you know, maybe next class we'll talk about in, uh, public key and private key. So what that ends up doing, just at a very high level, is you publish the salt you want people sending you a message to use. You say, if you send me a message, use this salt. So they use that salt. Now that's obviously something you can compute a rainbow on. And then uh, the algorithm gives you another key that only you know about that can be used to decrypt the salt that you gave out. So if someone sends you a message, you say, you know, encrypt it with this salt, send the message to me, I'll unencrypt it with, it, with an unencrypting salt, and then every time we want to keep changing the pair so nobody can, can calculate the rainbow of how we're communicating. <coughs>
but I just want to talk about, uh, let's see, two-way encryption. So two-way encryption is basically uh, where we can reverse it. Kind of the example we were using, where you take every letter and increment them by one. That's a reversible um, encryption algorithm. And an example of a one-way um, encryption would be, let's say we were using it, this is a different encryption algorithm. Let's say your password is cat. And we decided our encryption algorithm would be take the value of each letter, like C is the third letter, and A is the first letter, and T is the 20th letter. Take all the numbers and multiply them together, like 3 times 1 times 20 is 60. And then we'll store 60 in the database. So if somebody comes along and they type in, their, you know, we say, what is your password? They type in cat. We change cat into 3 times 1 times 20, we change that into 60, we compare what they, we compare that 60 to what the 60 in the database, we say, oh, they got the password right, we'll let them in. But if somebody's password was Fed, maybe they were born in February, so they use Fed as their uh, password, well, that would be 6 times 5 times 2, which is also 6. Okay, so, um, if you found 60 in the database, you wouldn't be able to say, oh, I know the password was cat, because it could also be fed, and there's probably a few other things it could be. So this is an example where the, you can encrypt one way, but you could never, even if you knew the encryption algorithm, you can't come back. It, even though we know the algorithm, 60, we can't quite figure out what it is. But there's, there's a bunch of things it could be. So the downside to this is, um, Right, so you can never calculate you can never calculate the rainbow of this because if we put in 60, it might spit back many passwords. So it'd be tough to do the rainbow for it. The downside is uh, a person whose password is cat, somebody could try FEB and they would log it. <laughs> you know, because it, it encrypts to the same value. So we wouldn't want like I mean a really bad algorithm is whatever you type in, we encrypt it to the number one. The whole database is ones. So everything you can log in with anything. That wouldn't be good. Yeah, DEC would also give you sixty. So if you had December as well, right? As well. But you yeah. would have to know what the what the encryption is. What the, the yeah. But even if you didn't know, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't be able to reverse engineer exactly the right password because there are more than one possibility. True. Well, no. Actually, well, so if we if we had access to the algorithm but didn't know how it works. We would say cat equals 60, feb equals 60, and like you say, DBC. but we wouldn't know how it got there. Or right, but that, there. right. Well, that no, but that's the thing. When computing the rainbow, you don't have to know how the algorithm works. You just have to have access to it. Right. But in this case, if we computed cat equals 60, feb equals 60, and dec equals 60, and there's probably many other things that equal 60, and then you got someone's password is if the encrypted value is 60 it's hard for you to figure out what their original password is because there's many combinations. Yeah. So even if we computed the rainbow, it's not very helpful to us. So that's got, you know, one-way encryption versus two-way encryption. But when we talk about, um, when we talk about, and this is a good place for us to stop and we'll pick it up from here next time. When we talk about the idea of a public key, private key combination, we're going to ask an algorithm so, so there's an algorithm, and it's using the idea of salting. We're going to ask the algorithm for a public, we're going to ask the algorithm for a key to encrypt with and a matching key to decrypt with. And we're going to give anyone who wants to send our website a message, we'll give them a public key. They'll encrypt with that, so they'll use the public key as a salt. Send us a message, and then we'll use a different key that came with the public key, which we'll call the private key because we don't publish it we'll use that to unencrypt it. So that would be a two-way encryption. And we wouldn't want the algorithm to just have one salt that encrypts and decrypts because we're going to publish the public one to the world. And if we publish, you know, and that, then they'd be able to compute our rainbow if they knew. You know what I mean? So if we, if we had, if we had um, like this example, um, So in this example, like let's say, so let's say in this case, we were using this as the salt. We take each of the letters and increment the first one by one, the second one by two, and so on. 
the corresponding unencryption, I guess, would be negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, right? Right. So if we if we take Bosco and then we say positive one means increment b becomes c. If someone sent you this, how do you make the c go back to a b? You would subtract one. Right, so the unencrypting key would be negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5. Or you'd have 25 to go all the way around again. What? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That would be another way. Right, so wait, 26 letters in the alphabet. If, if we said add 25 letters, it would, it would wrap around to the letter before. Yeah. And then this, so right, so another, yeah, that's a good point. So another key that we could use to take this and convert it to this would be, what, 20, 20, 25, 25 20, 23, 4, 23, 22, 21. Yeah. Right. So if we ran, so that's an example of, of the encryption algorithm. You use 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 as your encryption key, and then, you know, either negative 1, negative 2, 5, or 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, and that's the decryption key. So the way that the public pair, private pair, and like I said, we'll go over this next class, but what it's going to do is we're going to ask the algorithm for a pair of keys, one to encrypt with, one to decrypt with. We will publish the, we'll pick one of them, call that the public key, publish that to the world. So they'll send us messages using this as the soul. And then we know 25, 24, 23, 22, 21 is the way to unencrypt it. And, you know, that's how that's the right. message will come to us. Now, once the world knows our salt is one, two, three, four, five, they could then begin spending several months computing our rainbow. So we would keep asking the algorithm once a month or so for a different pair. Throw out last month's pair and start using a new pair. So again, these rainbow computing people can't keep up with us. And we'll say all messages must be at least eight characters, and, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, so yeah, so when we talk about the, the concept of yeah, public key, private key, uh, key encryption, that's used like when you go to a, a, a website that starts with HTTPS. The S stands for secure communication. And what that's doing is it's, it's making every message, like if you, so for example, if you go to www.facebook, I'm sorry, HTTP, um, colon slash slash www.facebook.com and hit enter, it will return the page and it'll now say HTTPS. Yeah, let me just do it now. <laughs> uh, Websites, big public websites, HTTPS. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. So yeah, so it came back. I don't know if that's getting picked up, but it came back as HTTPS. So we sent the message to them, basically an unsecure message saying, you know, I want to connect to you. They came back to us with this HTTPS thing. So embedded in this message back to us is their public key. Now every message our browser sends them will get encrypted because the very next thing we're going to send them is a message that says something like email with your email address and password and then in parentheses your password. And we don't, if, you're, if you're sitting in a Starbucks and it's going through their connection and over the internet, anybody listening can, can read what we're sending. So we'd like to take that message, encrypt it, and then send it. So our web browser is going to encrypt it with Facebook's public key. Then we'll send the message out, and when Facebook receives it, they have the private key to decrypt it. So yeah, if you so if 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 you see one of these little ringy dink websites, you know you want to go shopping online, and some little website you never heard of before, and you're thinking, oh. If I open up an account and give my password here, will some employee, you know, maybe it's a three-person employee or some uh, three, three-man company, will they see my password and then they'll be able to log into my bank account if I'm using the same password? It's pretty easy on their side to use the, they don't have to go and write an encryption algorithm. They could just take the one that comes with, if they're using PHP or JSP or ASP, 
whatever they're using to make their website, those web those programming languages come with an encryption algorithm. Hopefully it's a salted one. And the creators of the website just, you know, let's say the name of the algorithm is encrypt, they would just take your password, make up a salt and encrypt it, and no employee on their side could know what it means and you know should be okay. They didn't bother to do that. Um, we always have the same salt though. I mean, would the change that, over time? At that company? Mm. Well, it's up to them to change it they every month. But if it's a really small company, these big hackers aren't going to go. The big hackers go after Facebook and YouTube, you know, the big and LinkedIn. Well, there was a big thing today about eBay. I don't know if oh, you saw it. Yeah, a huge announcement about a I database of eBay passwords. Everybody was told to change their password. Did you oh, really? Yeah, I saw it first. Did you see it? I got an alert this morning um, on the BBC, oh. and then I got a follow up later later on in the day. So of course, first thing I did was went and changed my eBay password. Um, but it was it was big news today. Did you stop the camera finally? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, just do Google so News, and then just do for eBay. Password, and then just do look in uh, news. Yeah, change. There, it's right there. One point, uh, 145 million users to change passwords after. Yeah, oh, it's right yeah. there at the top. Yeah. And this was something that happened about two months ago that they got hacked, and it's just coming out now, which uh, was a bit odd. So it's not all the users, it's some of them. 145 million is no, not I, enough. I know. But, but it's, a, yeah, so an, another thing, and that and it's the same thing with LinkedIn. Yep. Um, they don't put all the passwords of all the of all their customers in one place. Right. They're like scattered across different servers, and then if you hack into one server, you get, you know, 5% of the, the password. So you don't, it's not all of them at once, but. Yeah, it was yeah, in February. Yeah. So uh, what I'm saying is, uh, you know, the, the even smaller websites that you know you you go shopping on, and it's not like a big one like Amazon.com, but um, it's very simple for them to to secure the passwords. Just use use the you know the algorithm that the NSA provides. It's a very good algorithm. They make up a salt. Hopefully, it's not like LinkedIn where yeah. they forget to use a salt because <laughs> it's real easy. Just make one up, ABC, and then you know. The only way anyone could get your password is they'd have to compute the rainbow for that algorithm with the ABC as the salt. And no one's got time for that, hopefully. So, so it's, it's fairly easy to for for a very small website to secure your password, unless they're you know malicious. They're in the business of selling you a T-shirt and then getting your password, but hopefully that's not the case. <laughs> okay.